So this is, uh, is uh, going to be a very busy month for me. This is uh, early June. I'm here in Minnesota. I'm from Canada, uh, London, Ontario, not far from Detroit. And uh, I'll be in uh, Switzerland in mid-June, June 11th to 16th, because the, uh, the uh, Death with Dignity people, the dying people, they, uh, they have their, their uh, international conference in Zurich. Uh, June, uh, around that same time. We're going to do a little bit of a counter-conference and a press conference and everything at the same time. And then I'm going on to Australia. So I was in Australia about a year and a half ago. Now, um, you know, all this political rambling to try and legalize euthanasia, assisted suicide, it's going on in the United States, state to state, it's going on in Canada, and it's going on big time in, the, in Australia. Australia it's, it's, has a similar setup as in the U.S. They have different states. And it's a statewide issue like it is in the U.S. In Canada, it's a federal issue. Just so you know, it's, it's centralized then. So uh, when I went about a year and a half ago, they invited me to speak because they thought, okay, well, this euthanasia guy is a good topic. We're going to have him come down. And I went across. I, I hit um, five cities in six days. So it was like a whirlwind tour. And when I was in Adelaide, South Australia, I, I met this, uh, this uh, guy who had been involved with quite a few things already. And he was really interested in the topic, and I said, that's good, because they invited me here to get the troops going to, to defeat this stuff in Australia, and I came here to start a group. And I said, so this is good, because finally I found someone who wants to start a group. He started the group Hope, which is Paul Russell. So now they're inviting me back to speak again. I get to go to New Zealand, too. There's a conference on June 30th, somewhat like this. Uh, and it's, uh, and um, once again, I get to be the key speaker. I put together a, I usually give, um, you know, these long, boring presentations that I put people to sleep. So, and here I had two presentations, so I sort of split it up. So this is a little bit different. I'm going to give you a worldwide perspective, but I'm going to try and focus more on the U.S. and a bit of some important topics. I'm going to do something else that is going to try and set, set the stage for the day. And that is um, we're going to focus on the issue a bit, and we're going to focus on terminology too. Uh, there's going to be a problem with terminology because a lot of the things that you're going to hear about the question is, is it euthanasia, is it assisted suicide, is it abuse, is it medical abuse, uh, what is it? And uh, it's important to be sort of clear. The other side wants us to be confused, right? The other side wins when we're confused. That's the key. And uh, when we go through these issues, they talk about issues, they say, oh, well, you know, this is happening, that is happening. Well, let's define it for what it actually is. Be clear about what it is because, you know, most people don't like the idea of giving somebody else the right to cause their death. They don't like that idea. They might fear suffering, right? They might have seen a friend or a family member die in a terrible condition. They thought, no, I wouldn't want to go through that. Like, I don't think there's anybody in this room who would look forward to suffering if that was something that was coming your way. You know, if you felt that with having a ALS, you know, Lou Gehrig's disease, that you just couldn't handle that. There's no, there's no one here who would actually look forward to that, right? Nonetheless, we understand that uh, you legalizing euthanasia or assisted suicide. In the, in the U.S., you're actually talking about assisted suicide, whereas in the rest of the world, they're mainly talking about euthanasia, just so you know that's how it is. Um, but in fact, they're two birds of a feather that flock together, you know. So let's lo look at this. And I, I talk about how we, how we win this is by we, we focus on the likely victims. We have to make it as more of a story model. And I give you the example of uh, I was on a TV show a few years ago, and I'm embarrassed to say, my main video that I sell everywhere I go is called Turning the Tide, and I didn't bring any with me. And it's some, there's a lady here who mentioned that she ordered it off me, and I thought, oh, yeah, I didn't bring any with me. Uh, but I can take orders for it. It's a 25-minute video. But the whole point was is I was in this debate on this uh, TV show in, in Canada with the Dying with Dignity guy, and I thought I gave a great response. I was doing really well, and then he started telling some story about somebody who had phoned their office who was suffering greatly. I don't know if the story was true or not. It doesn't matter. I knew that in TV land, I was losing the debate because the emotions are for the story. None of us want to experience that, right? We have to focus on the victims. They might tell stories about people who are suffering, but there's equally people who are going to lose their lives without consent. There's equally people who will be threatened by this. And, uh, and these are important stories. It's important to talk about how this affects you and I in the direct negative sense. I talk about focusing on elder abuse. And I'm going to get into that a little bit, but the whole point about elder abuse is it's a rampant problem within our culture. A rampant, rampant problem within our culture. We have an aging population, and like never before, we're finally starting to do something and identifying this problem of elder abuse. Well, the reason this is such an important issue is because 
people don't report elder abuse. And so we've got this massively uh, uncontrolled problem within our culture of elder abuse. And then you've got a whole other group of people saying, oh, well, let's legalize assisted suicide and no, we can control it and there won't be any problems. Well, that's inconsistent. That doesn't make any sense, does it? My, uh, elder, elder abuse doesn't only include financial abuse. It includes uh, physical abuse and sometimes even homicide. It's an important point. And we must work with people from all points of view. And that's very important. Oh, good. So what is euthanasia? Well, euthanasia, as you see here, it's an action or an omission of an action. It's intentionally done to cause death. And what makes it different from any other form of murder, homicide, is the fact that it's done for reasons of suffering. That's the only reason we talk about it as being something different, because in fact, it is a form of homicide. It's murder. What it is, is someone is causing your death. They're killing you. They're intentionally doing so. It is the cause of death. It's not an accidental cause of death. It is the cause of death. So some of these issues we're going to get into about uh, medical abuse and things like that are not necessarily euthanasia, unless the intention is to cause death. Sometimes they're medical abuse. Right? It's important to notice that. Uh, someone says, well, how do I know it's euthanasia? Well, is it a, would it be a homicide? Did someone actually kill you? Did they intend to kill you? Yes. Did you die from that? Yes. Well, that pretty much makes it euthanasia. Do you feel comfortable? Would you feel comfortable with your doctor having the right to cause your death? I don't feel comfortable with that. I like my doctor. I like him a lot. I don't feel comfortable with that concept of giving him the right to cause my death. I think it's quite clear. Most of the world is talking about legalizing euthanasia. In the U.S., though, they, uh, there seems to be more squeamish nature about the concept of giving someone the right to kill you, so they talk about assisted suicide. In Canada, the big push is euthanasia. In Europe, it's all euthanasia. Euthanasia, euthanasia. It's usually done by lethal injection. It can be done many ways, obviously. But, you know, lethal injection is pretty clean, you know. I use the term lethal injection because we have to use that term because... Um, it's very descriptive, it's vivid, it's to the point. And it only differs from common homicide in its intent. Some people call it mercy killing. So clearly, if someone unintentionally causes someone's death, that would not be euthanasia, would it? It was unintentional. It might be medical abuse. It might be that they're liable for something. That's true. But it's intentional. It is the cause of death. It is a form of homicide. Murder. Euthanasia is not. Withholding or withdrawing medical treatment. Now, you use a, there's a problem in our terminology today. I always use the term medical treatment because it's an accurate term, but the problem is medical treatment's been redefined in our modern culture. So that's another issue I'm going to get into next. But withdrawing medical treatment, especially when it's useless, futile, burdensome, extraordinary, you have the right to also say no to medical treatment. We're not, we're not opposed to someone accepting the limits of life. There's no one... There's nobody here who is saying that, oh, you must get every possible second out of your life. No one's saying that. We're saying no one should have the right to kill you. Right? There's a clear difference. Clear difference. Physicians, of course, when I mention this, physicians should be very careful about depression. Depression issues affect the med medical treatment questions. They also affect the issue of euthanasia and assisted suicide. Depression is a very common response. If you were experiencing a, a terminal condition, certainly in the beginning when you find out about it, it is a normal human response. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are, that you will be somewhat uh, emotionally in angst over it. That's normal and human. We are physical beings, but we are emotional beings, and we are interconnected beings. We're not um, you know, beings that can separate ourselves out. We are one. The proper use of large doses of pain, killing drugs to relieve suffering, is not euthanasia. Now, I say the proper use. There's going to be another talk later about the improper use, the abuse of what's going on that is intentionally causing death. But the proper use, we, want, we don't want to discourage the proper use of painkilling medication, do we? We don't want to discourage the proper use of these drugs that will uh, create uh, comfort for people who are going through difficult symptoms. And sometimes the symptoms are extreme. We understand that. There are some cases that are very extreme. And sometimes it would require a large dose of morphine, so long as it's properly done and par properly titrated and they're following the proper... We're not opposed to that. We're opposed to the abuse of it. The actual killing of people is what we're opposed to. We're not opposed to the proper use of sedation. 
And if you look at uh, understanding of how this is defined, there's nothing morally wrong with sedating someone. There's something morally wrong, though, with sedating them to kill them. Right? If, if I'm in intractable pain and the doctor says, yes, but we, we can sedate you, that's not, there's nothing morally wrong with sedating that person. <coughs> but if uh, you use uh, terminal sedation, which tends to be uh, sedating them and then dehydrating them, that's morally wrong. The proper use we're not opposed to. These things should not be referred to as euthanasia or assisted suicide. And in fact, we're all in favor of properly using these techniques. Did I switch? Euthanasia by omission. Well, that's another issue. So what is this about? The problem is the law and the courts have, have actually defined this out of existence in the U.S. and Canada. In Canada, we actually haven't had the court cases, but because of uh, the flow over of ethical issues, um, everything that is going on in the U.S. goes on in Canada, even though we never had um, a legal decision saying it's acceptable. It's just ethically accepted. It's just done, right? And this is about the um, withdrawal of basic medical care. Usually we're talking about food and fluids, most commonly, with the intention of causing death for someone who's not otherwise dying. So let's be very clear about this. When somebody is dying and nearing death, what is the natural process in the body? Well, the body begins to shut down, right? They begin to experience organ failure, uh, you know, their respiration slows, they, they sometimes very often become unable to assimilate, you know, their body is not circulating. All these things are happening. Obviously, you cannot put food and fluids into a body, nutrition, hydration, into a body that cannot use it. They're nearing death. Now we're talking about very end stage life conditions, aren't we? But then there's the other issue. Someone like a Terry Schiavo. Terry Schiavo was not dying. Terry Schiavo had a head injury, uh, not head injury, she had a, a cognitive disability, right? She had, due to something that had happened that is un, undetermined uh, what happened, but nonetheless, she, uh, she became in this situation where she was in a type of not quite a persistent vegetative state, but she was not a somewhat non-responsive state. And her husband decided that they would dehydrate her to death. But she was not otherwise dying. That is ethically a form of euthanasia. Legally, though, it's called re, uh, refusing medical treatment. But it's not medical treatment. That means everybody here had some medical treatment this morning. <laughs> I had to get up early and I made coffee in the hotel room that coffee was my medical treatment. Now there was enough caffeine in it that maybe it was a bit of a treatment, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not medical treatment. But once again, we're get, getting into this problem of the redefinition of truth, which has been going on. It's different than accepting the limits of life. And I made it very clear, when someone's actually dying, there's a big difference between people who are actually dying and those who are not otherwise dying. You may say, yeah, but how often does this go, does this go on? Well, I'll give you an example. So I live in a, in a city, London, Ontario, and it has um, a teaching hospital. So they teach physicians, right? And there's a, um, a doctor in our city who's a great palliative care physician who everybody respects, and she's very much opposed to euthanasia and assisted suicide. So a couple years ago, I sat down and had a lunch with her, and um, she got our material and everything. And she said, oh, yeah, you guys are doing great things here, there, and everything, but this issue of food and fluids, I don't agree with you about. And I said, oh, well, what's going on? She says, well, you know, actually, she says, I must admit, 10 years ago, I would have agreed with you. But she said, you know, what are we going to do with all these people who have had head injuries or have, have had strokes, and they've been stabilized, but they're not coming back. They're mentally, they're, they're, they're you know, they've had brain damage. They're not coming. What are we going to do with them all? Where are we going to house them? She says, well, you know, we just withdraw their food and fluids, and they die of dehydration. They don't die of... You don't die of starvation, just so you know. That takes a very long time. You die of dehydration. And it's reasonably quick. And she's the good one. So we need to properly define what this is. The other side wants to call it aid in dying. You're going to hear this term, aid in dying. I hate this term, aid in dying. Absolutely hate it. It's not about aid in dying. Good palliative care, proper palliative care, that is aid in dying, aiding you while you're dying. They, why, why do they come up with these, like the euthanasia lobby, the compassion and choices people? How many here have heard that term, compassion and choices, that name? Many of you? Well, you should all have heard it. That's the big group from the other side, compassion and choices. They're very smart. 
They have a good name. They used to be the Hemlock Society. You probably had heard of the Hemlock Society because that was the group that had existed before. And now they're called Compassion and Choices. Wonderful name. We all want compassion. We all want choices. They're very smart. Very smart name. Why do they come up with the term aid in dying? Well, we all want aid in dying, right? Assisted suicide is when one person is directly intentionally involved with causing the death of another person. It's about aiding their death, encouraging their death, their counseling suicide. So what makes assisted suicide then different from euthanasia? She should be shouting this out. Well, what is different is that according to the definitions, assisted suicide, you do it to yourself with the help of another, whereas in the case of euthanasia, it's done to you. So the clear definition to make the difference is in euthanasia, I give you the lethal injection. You're laying there and you're lethally injected. And then assisted suicide would be the doctor most often would then write a prescription for a lethal dose, knowing your intention to take that lethal dose. And uh, you then supposedly take it yourself. Now, I said two birds of a feather flock together. How do you separate euthanasia from assisted suicide? Um, you actually really can't. Because who's to know once you have the lethal dose whether you took it yourself or someone gave it to you? Who's to know? And in fact, how they usually do is they mix it up with this applesauce type stuff and then they feed it to you. Uh, would that not be a form of euthanasia? Could you not see it that way? It pretty much is. Uh, what if you have ALS and you can't do it to yourself anyway? Someone's got to give it to you. And how are they giving it to you? And when are they giving it to you? Once you have one, you really have the other in the end. I also said, please use the term assisted suicide. I don't use the term physician assisted suicide because that assumes that only physicians will do it. Uh, the, the, in, in Oregon and Washington State, it's defined as physician assisted suicide because the physician has to write the lethal dose. So that's accurate. But you know, the, uh, in, in Canada, when they were talking about euthanasia and assisted suicide, others could do it, as crazy as that might sound. You know, you could kill your spouse, according to the definitions they were using. So it wouldn't be physician-assisted suicide, it would be assisted suicide. The other thing is that we're, we don't want to refer to things in a medical context. Some people like to use this term, doctor-prescribed death or doctor-prescribed suicide. I don't touch that term. I never use it, ever. Uh, I talked to the polling company that was involved in that terminology. Uh, they did some polling to say which term is more effective for the public, assisted suicide, doctor prescribed death, doctor prescribed suicide. And uh, they found out that uh, doctor prescribed death or doctor prescribed suicide was a little bit more effective. So I talked to the polling company who did all that work and they said to me, well, the difference was so minor that in fact you didn't really make much of a difference anyway. I don't like those terms, doctor prescribed suicide, doctor prescribed death, only because it puts the issue into a medical model. We don't do well there. We don't do well because a lot of people do trust their doctors. A lot of people want their doctors to have some control. They fear death and they're saying, well, if the doctor can do this and the doctor says it's okay, well, maybe it's not so bad. In the social context, we do very well. People with disabilities, elder abuse, issues like that. Those are the issues that we do well on. You don't want to put it into a medical model. And the other thing is, doctors don't like the term doctor prescribed death because it assumes that a lot of them wear horns. They're, they're going to kill you. And they don't like that. The good doctors really don't like that term. In fact, in Vermont, the group, um, the, uh, doc, you know, the doctors group in Vermont that's been opposing the assisted suicide, they said, we refuse to use that term because we're trying to have more doctors agree with us. And this term seems to push them away from us. So uh, I use the term assisted suicide. I think that's the most descriptive and accurate term. And I tell you again, we do far better in the social model. Yeah. I was just going to add to your um, definition issue that, of course, um, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants can also prescribe narcotics and euthanasia. Now, in, in Washington State and Oregon, where it's legal, they don't have that. They only have the physicians allowed to prescribe. Now, if you're talking about Belgium, for instance, in Belgium, nurses can do it. Yeah. That's a whole other issue. But So we need to be clear about what this is, and that's what I'm trying to get to. Why do we need to be so clear? Well, many bioethicists, and actually the modern thought today is that there's no difference between killing and letting die. No difference between killing and letting die. And you might think, well, someone here studying philosophy has probably heard these terms before. There's no difference between killing and letting die. You know, certainly Peter Singer and the modern bioethicists, that's what they say, which is a foolish idea. 
there's a huge difference between me killing you and letting you die. Um, and I'll give you a prime example, and I'll even use a very difficult, difficult, difficult medical model to explain it to you, and that is, um, let's say someone is in a situation where it appears that they are dying, and they are on a ventilator, and we withdraw the ventilator, or it's agreed, yes, we're going to withdraw the ventilator. Now, there might be a lot of moral issues around that. I'm not going to argue that, but they might have considered it appropriate to withdraw the ventilator. What happens? The person sometimes dies. Does the person always die? No. In fact, if you look at any of the studies that have been done on this, approximately 10% of the people who have their ventilators withdrawn don't die at all, meaning they not only don't, don't die within a, a, a few days, they just don't die at all. So therefore, if you give me a lethal dose, lethal injection, lethal dose, what happens to me? I'm dead. Obviously, there must be a difference between killing and letting die from the very basic, from the beginning. Secondly, if I withdraw the ventilator, if the ventilator is withdrawn, what happens to the person if they die? They might not die immediately, right? They might breathe for a while and then die. But if they die, what did they die of? It was their medical condition that caused their death. So yes, there's a lot of ethics around withdrawing a ventilator. There's a lot of issues around that. But even in that circumstance, clearly there's a difference between killing and letting die. And so why do they say there's no difference between killing and letting die? Because then they can say to you, well, we do this all the time anyway. We withdraw life-sustaining treatment all the time anyway. Why don't we just leave it to suicide? It's the same thing. They're trying to convince you of something that's not there. Right? The emperor has no clothes, right? It's a modern fallacy. Peter Singer certainly promotes it. And the other thing we have to understand, modern philosophy, um, the modern philosophy, the prevailing trend today is not the traditional ideology of the past. It is Peter Singer now. He is the, the main mind of the day. And uh, you, know, you don't have to go very far to start reading philosophical journals to realize that uh, Peter Singer is king now. And when I say Peter Singer, I'm talking about a guy who believes in uh, euthanasia, assisted suicide, he's the father of the animal rights movement, all the rest of it. He is the king of philosophy today, whether we like it or not. Okay, so let's look at what's going on. This has been a very active issue. I don't know how many of you here realize how active an issue this is, but in the U.S. alone, this issue has been engaged. First of all, assisted suicide is legal in Oregon for, quite, for well over 10 years now, about 13 years now. Washington State, both were done by voter initiatives. And it is, it is what you, in a, in a funny state within Montana, a funny condition right now in Montana. I'll get into that. But in the last year alone, there's been battles in Montana, Hawaii, Connecticut, Vermont, Massachusetts, Maine, Wisconsin, Idaho. There's actually been a bill in Pennsylvania. Uh, this has been debated, of course, now in Louisiana, Georgia. This is very big. In Massachusetts, you realize, everybody here realizes there's a voter initiative going in the next ballot in November? How many of you realize that? Now, I told you, you should all put up your hands because I said it first. But I mean, before I said it, did you, did you realize in Massachusetts there's a voter initiative? That's huge. Massachusetts, this is a ma huge situation. Uh, euthanasia assisted suicide is being debated in Canada, France, India, Australia, England, Scotland, Israel, Spain, etc., etc., etc. Huge. These, these next couple of years are, are the watershed years on this issue. And I can tell you one thing. If you lose in Massachusetts, you're in trouble. You're in serious trouble in the U.S. Euthanasia is legal in Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Oregon, and Washington State. Uh, sorry, euthanasia is not legal in Oregon and Washington. It's assisted suicide. It's Nether Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. And assisted suicide is Netherlands, Luxembourg, Oregon, and Washington State. Notice Belgium does not have legal assisted suicide. It's only euthanasia. They don't want you killing yourself with their assistance. They just want to kill you. Right? <laughs> Belgium's a very interesting place. So this is possibly one of the hottest issues going on right now. It is about life and death direct. It's not indirect. Montana. Montana is a funny sort of thing. There was a court case in Montana, the Baxter case. Yes?
absolutely. Well, okay, the answer to the question is absolutely yes. You have the right to refuse treatment, but you know. But further, we should discuss the the implications of certain parts of that. Okay, there's certain parts of that issue that you want to maybe think about. Nonetheless, yes, you have the total right to refuse treatment. And this is not about the right to refuse treatment. You have the right to refuse treatment. This is about someone being involved in killing you. And there's a total difference between us unplugging the plug, as you would say, and me giving you a lethal dose. Now, the issues do uh, mix up a bit at times, absolutely. But uh, there is a clear difference. And I think you should, uh, yeah, Ron's going to get into some of those other issues very clearly, especially around food and fluids. They're very concerning around those questions. So Montana. So the Baxter, Baxter decision, what it was is that uh, Compassion and Choice has made a, a court case. The Baxter decision in Montana was very interesting. So Compassion and Choice has brought a case to the Montana courts saying that the Montana Constitution allowed for assisted suicide. You had a right to assisted suicide in Montana and, uh, and um, Judge Dorothy McCarter agreed. She said, yeah, they have a right to assisted suicide in Montana. So that was then appealed to the Montana, to the Supreme Court of Montana. And then you get this funny judgment in the Baxter decision. It's a very weird decision. They said that there is no right to assisted suicide in Montana. Well, that was correct. Then they said, but see, they already have these, um, they have all these funny laws around withdrawing medical treatment. And they compared the issue to that. And then they said, well, a doctor who, who is prosecuted for assisted suicide, so they're not striking down the assisted suicide law, a doctor who's prosecuted for assisted suicide, so now you've been charged, can use a defensive consent. Well, what does that mean? So that means doctors can be charged with assisted suicide, but if charged, if they had consent, they can use that defense and they'll be fine. So what has happened is they've legalized but not legalized. And it's actually very interesting. So uh, some people were, were actually not very smart about this. And they said, oh, I guess Montana's legalized assisted suicide. We said, well, no, no, no. They've created a defense of consent, which is very troubling. But how many doctors actually want to be prosecuted? Not too many. So we emphasize, no, no, no. Actually, technically, assisted suicide is still illegal. Yes, they've given you a defense of consent. Um, do you want to get prosecuted first? No. So we've been trying to keep a lid on it. So then, then there was in the 2011 year, uh, they, uh, the legislative year, they only have, uh, the legislature only meets for about four months of every two years in Montana. I guess in Montana they're worried when the legislature is meeting that they're losing their freedoms or something. So they have them meet for a very short period of time every two years. And in that there was two bills, one to legalize assisted suicide and one to once again prohibit it. It removed the defense of consent. Both bills were defeated. So right now there's a group in Montana, Montanans Against Assisted Suicide and for Living with Dignity, and they're working on trying to make sure that the right people get elected, and in the next legislative session they try again. So it's not over in Montana, but it's a funny thing in Montana. It's not clear. Of course, Compassion Choices says to you it is legal in Montana, and, and the fact is, well, it's not quite legal. And uh, we should be clear that it's really not legal in Montana. Sadly, though, uh, doctors could probably get away with it. It's probably true. Good news, though. Georgia Governor Nathan Deal recently signed a bill that clearly prohibits assisted suicide. So what happened in Georgia? Well, how many people know about this final exit network? You should know about it. You're in Minnesota. Yeah. Right? You should know well about this group. I guess the Final Exit Network is in the courts here now, too, in Minnesota. Is that not? Yeah, it's correct, right? Yeah, I've got something in my presentation about it. Who are the Final Exit Network? Do you guys know who this is? Okay, there are a few uh, Derek Humphrey cronies, basically. They are former Hemlock Society leaders, and what they do is they counsel people to commit suicide. They're like a suicide club, you could say. And what they do is someone calls them up saying, uh, I'm suffering greatly. I like help to die, and they come and they visit you, they explain to you exactly what you need to do, they give you all the information. All they don't do, they say at least they don't do it, but there's proof otherwise, they don't actually provide you the means to do it. So if, you, if you're going to kill yourself, you have to come up with the means. And then they set the day and they sit with you and help you do it. So to make sure you carried it out. Let me tell you a little story. 
In 2006, I went to the World Federation of Right to Die Societies Conference, the International Death Conference. And I'm sitting there, and I was, it's a, it was like, you know, there was about 200 people there. And I thought I'd be going to a conference that was a little bit weird, but somewhat like this, meaning people who really believe in what they do. Uh, but what I met was something totally different. And people have heard me tell this story before. At least half of those people there had been involved with killing somebody, at least half, maybe more. And that's what their motivation was. They had killed their mom, a spouse, a friend, or they were part of one of these final exit type groups, these suicide groups that go visit people and they explain exactly how you kill yourself and then they hold your hand and they help you do it. In fact, they usually go with two people so they hold both hands. I'll get into that. <laughs> anyway, um, it's true. You've you got you to read this further. It's pretty crazy. And so they're pretty motivated. What I met actually at that meeting was a very motivated group of people. They really want the laws all to be struck down because they're doing this stuff. They're doing it all the time, and they would rather not go to jail. They think what they're doing is wonderful, right? Well, anyway, in Georgia, they got involved with killing a man who, was, who had had facial cancer, and he was actually successfully treated. He was in remission. He was scheduled to have facial reconstruction. He had lost uh, most of his chin in the whole... So he wasn't a happy person. He was actually quite depressed, and his wife knew he was on antidepressants. He was very depressed. He contacted the Final Exit Network. They came down, and they helped him kill himself. His wife had no idea about it until she found him dead, and she found some Final Exit Network information, and she put one and one together, and exactly it added up to two. They had killed her husband, who was very, very depressed. So then the Georgia uh, authorities, they charged the people in the Final Exit Network, but then they got off because the Georgia law was written around the time of Kevorkian and it said you're not allowed to advertise or promote suicide. Right? That's what the law basically said. It wasn't a properly written law. So in fact, that law got struck down. So Georgia had no law at all. And then this bill was introduced and passed which properly prohibits assisted suicide in Georgia. Now did you realize all that went on in Georgia in just the last few months? Yeah, for a very short period of time, Georgia could have, you could have had any assisted suicide go on in Georgia because Georgia, there was no law at all. There was nothing prohibiting it. Louisiana, Governor Bobby Jindal, who here is from Louisiana? Well, stand up. <laughs> Louisiana, Governor Bobby, Bobby uh, Jingle, Jingle? Is, is yeah. a, he's expected to sign this bill into law. What it is is they had a, a law prohibiting assisted suicide but it was defined as only for the terminally ill. That's, how it, that's what it focused on, the, the law. And so therefore, they just uh, changed the law a little bit, so now it, it includes all of us. You don't have to be terminally ill to be protected now in Louisiana. You know, I tell people, though, the problem you have in the U.S. is that you have different laws in every state. And some of those laws in, these, in the U.S., some of those states have, don't have assisted suicide statutes at all, meaning they're dependent on common law to protect people from assisted suicide. Some states have very poorly written laws. Some have good laws. And there's a whole mixture of them. There needs to be a lot of work done in the U.S. very soon to fix that problem. You know, in Canada, we have what I call the perfect law. It I'm, I'm serious. It, it follows common law. We have the same law as, the, as Australia, New Zealand, uh, U.K., England, Scotland, Canada. We all have the same law. It says you're not allowed to aid, encourage, or counsel suicide. It doesn't define it as terminally ill or anything like that. It doesn't say, oh, you know, it doesn't... It's just clear. You're not allowed to aid, encourage, or counsel suicide. Good law. It it's, it's includes everybody. More good news. Last year, Idaho passed a bill. And this is very interesting what happened in Idaho. You probably don't even realize what it went on in Idaho. What happened in Idaho is this very famous couple in Idaho, wealthy, famous couple, elderly couple. The husband, he killed his wife, and then he committed suicide, homicide, suicide. And she had been sick. She was terminally ill. And so Compassion and Choices jumped into Idaho saying, well, you know, this didn't have to happen. If you legalize assisted suicide, you know, this person could have had assisted suicide and he wouldn't have had to kill his wife and he wouldn't have had to kill himself. And they made a big deal about it. Well, that's pretty foolish. Because first of all, if you look at the homicide suicide stats, I don't have it here. There was a study done in Florida that was published in 2005 on homicide suicide, which looked at 20 cases of homicide suicide. So what you have is a situation, you have a sick spouse and a caregiver, and the caregiver kills the sick spouse and then commits suicide. 
And they looked at 20 cases in Florida. It was done by this Donna Cohen, who is a suicide researcher. She's, she's never s researched anything about assisted suicide, so we can't say, oh, she's our friend. I don't know. I don't know where she stands. And she found that of the 20 cases, almost every single one of them was actually murder suicide. And in almost all the cases, this was a controlling husband killing his spouse. And there were signs of, uh, in most of those cases, signs of the spouse who got killed resisting. So in fact, that's stupid of them to have gone with such a case. Nonetheless, they did that. And Idaho had a funny sort of law. So what happened is, is in the, uh, the, the pro-life group in Idaho in the next year, so that was last year, they brought a bill through and they got it passed almost unanimously to properly prohibit assisted suicide in Idaho. Vermont. Now Vermont is terrible. Uh, it's amazing that they've held off assisted suicide in Vermont. Uh, uh, governor Peter Shumlin in Vermont, he, he, before he was governor, he was a big promoter of assisted suicide. And in the last election, he made it one of his big planks, I'm going to legalize assisted suicide. He got a lot of money from the, uh, from the uh, suicide lobby. The Compassion and Choices people gave him a lot of money, helped him out big time financially. And he's not accomplished it. So that's good for us, good news. But you know, there's been bill after bill after bill. So this year alone, just think this So, The assisted suicide lobby, they presented a bill in the Vermont legislature. It went to the Justice Committee. It got defeated in the Justice Committee. You say, oh, it's done. Isn't that wonderful? We defeated the bill again. And when I say again, those of us who are involved in we know that Vermont, basically every year you can count on a couple of things in Vermont. An assisted suicide bill you can count on. <laughs> it will come forward. And we can count on the fact that, uh, well, I don't know, uh, I guess a poor economy. I don't know. But I mean, in Vermont, they do this every year without a question. So what do they do next? Well, we defeated the bill. It's gone, right? Well, one of the proponents, one of the pro-assisted suicide people was bringing forward a tanning bill regulation. Tanning bill, reg I mean, tanning bed regulations. So basically, it would say that if you're a teenager, you can't use tanning beds, right? She then attached the assisted suicide bill to the tanning bed regulation bill and brought it back. So it shows back up in the Vermont legislature. The tanning uh, bed regulations had already gone through committee, so it shows up in the House. Uh, the, the, uh, the people on our side said, uh, this is ridiculous. In the end, they did allow a debate, and we de defeated it 18 to 11 in the Senate. But it comes back again and again and again. Shumlin, though, is committed to legalizing. And I guess he's got two more years or something like that, so it's a problem. Hawaii. Hawaii has been pushing. Hawaii is a very uh, sad place because they almost legalized assisted suicide a few years ago, and then someone flipped their vote at the end, meaning that uh, when they had their first vote in, in the legislature on it, it was about, what, uh, 2007 or something like that. They passed the bill to legalize assisted suicide, and then went to, went to a final vote. There was a flip of a vote, and they defeated it. So that was very good. Anyway, in Hawaii, there was a 1909 bill that had nothing to do with assisted suicide that had passed the legislature. What it said is experimental drugs. So if, you, if you're terminally ill and you're dying and you're going to, and there's an experimental drug that's not yet been approved, that in Hawaii, you're allowed to attempt to use that experimental drug. So if you have cancer or a certain type of cancer and there's a drug being tested somewhere, in Hawaii, you're allowed to then attempt to use that drug if you're terminally ill to see if it will help you. That's what the bill says. So then the assisted suicide people, the compassion choices people, jumped on that saying, oh, well that means assisted suicide is technically legal in Hawaii. Well, what is assisted suicide? What is a lethal dose? It's not experimental, actually. These drugs aren't that actually uh, confusing either. You know? and, and they're not experimental in any way, shape, or form. But they said, oh, well that means assisted suicide is legal in Hawaii. And they've been pushing hard on that. Uh, the Attorney General in Hawaii said, no, that does not apply to drugs that you would use to kill yourself. Bad news. Assisted suicide has been legalized in Oregon, Washington State in 2009, Massachusetts. This is absolutely going to devastate you if they win in Massachusetts, the other side. Uh, Massachusetts is not only a major state, Massachusetts is the uh, medical capital, basically, of your U.S. It's got major medical hospitals. Uh, I know it's a, a quite a liberal state, but if Massachusetts goes, it's going to be awfully hard to hold Vermont. Uh, Maine's right north of there. They tried to legalize uh, suicide in Maine by a plebiscite a few, quite a few years ago, and they lost by 51 to 49. 
if Massachusetts goes, Vermont goes, Maine goes, you start naming it, they go. And then it spreads very fast. And I'm not a bearer of bad news. I'm actually quite an upbeat guy. I'm just being realistic, okay? I'm being very realistic. In fact, the polling shows we're, we're behind in Massachusetts by uh, 43 to 37. Uh, the undecided vote, I don't know if it comes our way or not. You should know more about this. Exit polling in Washington State. So we lost in Washington State by 58 to 42. That's bad. That's bad, okay? 58 to 42. If it was 51-49, you'd say that's terrible, but we, but we fought a darn good campaign. We came close. It was 58-42. The exit polling showed that 29% of self-identified pro-life people voted for the Assisted Suicide Act. 29% of the people who are members of the pro-life groups or identify themselves as pro-life voted for Assisted Suicide. 50% of people who self-identify themselves as Catholic voted for Assisted Suicide. Well, they have a whole set of conditions to it. That's correct. Well, in Washington and Oregon, they're the same. You need to have a doctor approve it, and then there has to be a second doctor saying yes also, so there has to be the two doctors. You have to be de uh, defined as being within six months of death, so that's the second thing. Uh, they have to, it says in the law, this is a whole other contentious issue I'll get into my other presentation in the afternoon about, they say in the law that you have to uh, be of sound mind, basically, right? You have to be able to consent properly. And uh, you, there is a, what, a 15-day waiting period before you can actually receive it. So then they approve you, there's a 15-day waiting period and things like that. So they have this whole set of parameters in it. The point of it is, is you've legalized the right of one person to intentionally be involved in causing the death of another person. So uh, the rules are the rules. But we lost that state basically because we didn't hold our base. Let's be brutally honest. It's sad, but it's true. Uh, we have to be quite introspective at times and realize that sometimes you know, sometimes we failed. Okay, well, euthanasia would be more comparable to a death penalty type issue because someone, someone does it to you. Assisted suicide is a bit of a, you know, technically speaking, it's a, it's a, it's a self-killing that someone assists you with. The point is we don't want people involved with causing your death in society. It's that simple. You know, someone will say to you, and that's the other argument that we have to watch about too. Someone will say to you, yes, but there's no law against suicide. That's true. There is no law against suicide. If you wanted to kill yourself, obviously we should be concerned about your mental illness issues and things like that. But really, there is no law against suicide. So then they'd say, well, how come there's a law against assisted suicide? And they think that's a logical response. But obviously, in any philosophical understanding, there's a big difference between somebody who kills himself and a situation where somebody else is involved with directly causing your death. I think there's a huge difference between the two. You know, and we shouldn't be allowing people to get involved with causing people's death. That, that's, gosh, man, holy camoly, watch out. I just think you should see these numbers because they're important as to how we do our work and how we convince people to be opposed to this. We were also, though, outspent in Washington State massively. The other side spent 5.5 million, and our side spent 1.7 million. And I think they did amazingly well to, re to actually um, build that 1.7 million. So let's think about the history of this. In 1991, there was a, an initiative in Washington State to legalize assisted suicide. And actually, that, that one would have legalized, I believe, euthanasia too in 1991. And it failed. It was 54 to 46 in 1991. So the Compassion and Choices people, I guess they were called Hemlock Society at the time, they did not disband. They kept going. And they kept going, and they kept their group going. And they kept building their membership and keeping at it. So when they went at it the second time in 2009, they had a fairly large organization in place. Um, our side, what we did is when they announced that they were working on building an initiative, our people started you know, feeling out trying to find how they could build their own coalition. But you know, that's a last minute thing. So to raise 1.7 million that way was actually quite impressive. Let's be brutally honest. That's very impressive. Um, Washington State Medical Association, they held against, they, they, they remained against assisted suicide, and even today they continue to be against, even though it's legal in Washington State. Now, in Oregon, that's not true. In the state of Oregon, the medical association went neutral when they legalized. But here, they stayed against. So that's an important. The other side effectively, though, labeled this as a religious issue. They did a very good job on that. And so the fact is, is Washington State is a, very, um, is a very secular state, sort of like Massachusetts, quite secular. And by labeling it a very religious issue, 
then it becomes a case of it's an issue of religious people against secular people and of course people who are more secular in thinking uh, would then not uh, want to be voting against it. So they labeled it very effectively and I say we can't repeat that mistake and it appears though that we are repeating a mistake. If we lose in Massachusetts, what happens? It will have a huge effect. I guarantee you it would affect all the New England states in a very, very quick manner. Most of those New England states tend to be fairly, uh, fairly secular. It would affect Canada. Massachusetts is not, for Boston is not far from Canada. It would affect Canada. If we lose in Massachusetts, it would, uh, it would really be a real blow. And I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not trying to overstate anything to make you feel like holy camoly. I'm just trying to say the truth. Uh, this whole thing changes after that election in Massachusetts. How we fight it, what we do, how we hold our states, everything becomes brand new again. Washington State, you could still contain it. Massachusetts is a very different animal. And there's no effective coalition in Massachusetts. They've not formed one. The only identified groups opposing assisted suicide are the Catholic Church and the disability community. The disability community has formed a group called Second Thoughts. They're doing a very effective job. The Catholic Church has been very loud, very active. Some people say, well, you know, if the Catholic Church were to do more, they're doing actually a lot. But the problem then comes, well, because they are the two identified groups. You do have the disability group, but they have no money whatsoever. They really don't. There's a few good hearted people who are doing a very good job, but they have no resources. And then you have the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church is being very visual. And, and yes, I'm not saying they shouldn't be, I'm not saying they shouldn't be involved, but because that becomes the whole void. It, it just labels the whole issue. It, it's hard to win. Do we need laws prohibiting assisted suicide? Well, yeah. Elder abuse, depression, people with disabilities. I always say remember our human history. Remember human history? Uh, I'm not going to go into the Minnesota thing. We could talk about it later. How about Nadia? Nadia Kijiji, do you remember her? How about this guy? Melker Dinkle. Do you guys remember him? He's from Minnesota. Yeah. He was a nurse in Minnesota who was online counseling suicide. Nadia died in Ottawa, Ontario. Died of, she committed suicide in Ottawa, Ontario. This guy convinced her online that he was a female nurse. Doesn't look too much like a female nurse. He said he was a young female nurse. He said he was 28. Doesn't look 28. And he convinced her that he was going through depression like she was going through depression and he convinced her to kill herself. Not too nice a guy. He says it's free speech. He believes it's just about freedom of speech. Do we need laws to protect our vulnerable? Absolutely we do. And that's more about us. I have a table out there. I have some materials. In your package you have my last newsletter. Voila, it's in your package. You have my latest pamphlet. Now it's Canadian, but the arguments are still very good. <laughs> uh, and you have another pamphlet called Carry Not Killing. I have some stuff on the table. I didn't expect it to disappear so quick, so it looks like I'm taking orders for stuff from now on. And if you want to be on my email list and know what's going on everywhere, I have an email list or a mailing list. Thank you very much.